Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the arrival of Prime Minister John Key, New Zealand. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we begin with session five, our summit dialogue on the global trading system. Please join me now in welcoming our moderator for this session, Susan Schwab, a former US trade representative. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, delighted to be here, delighted to be back at APEC with this exceptional panel. Prime Minister John Key of New Zealand, Indonesian Trade Minister Gita, President and COO, FedEx Express International, Ducker, and Chairman of Kedanren, Sumitomo Chemical, Yonakura. You'll find their bios in your uh, materials for the conference, so I'm not going to spend time describing their many attributes and skills and background, but they are exceptional, and we are going to uh, find, we are going to prove that in our questions and their answers. APEC is the perfect venue to talk about trade. Bali is the perfect place to talk about trade. And now is the perfect time to be talking about the future of the global trading system. A couple words about APEC. APEC is a unique organization when it comes to trade policy. For those of us in the international trade negotiating business, those of us who've been in that business, this is a can-do crowd. And it is always a pleasure to participate in an APEC CEO summit or an APEC summit. There are success stories among the Asia-Pacific members and businesses associated with APEC that I get a chance to teach at the University of Maryland to my classes. There are trade initiatives that have come out of the APEC region and APEC meetings, starting with the Boger goals uh, to include the various trade facilitation measures and as recently as last year, the environmental goods tariff cutting initiative that came out of Vladivostok. I had the privilege of attending several uh, summits, APEC summits with President Bush in Hanoi, in Sydney, and in Lima, and the opportunity to attend the 2011 uh, summit that was hosted by President Obama in Honolulu. And uh, the U.S. is very well represented at this APEC summit with Mike Froman, uh, the U.S. trade representative, my successor, Penny Pritzker, a highly talented new Secretary of Commerce, and of course, our Secretary of State, John Kerry. Not to mention the 200 U.S. business delegates who are here representing 75 corporations at very high levels. And so with this set of interests and this history and this remarkable region at the fore, what better time to talk about a region that is facing many of the challenges and many of the opportunities that the world trading system is facing. And let me begin my questions with one to Prime Minister John Key. New Zealand, New Zealand is an amazing country that punches well above its weight in the international trade business. You have fielded some remarkable trade negotiators. You have free trade agreements with 
uh, a remarkable number of countries. Uh, you are involved in mega regional negotiations, uh, RCEP, uh, involving ASEAN and six other countries, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, you had a lot to do with getting the United States involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiation, which we launched at the end of the Bush administration. When you and your leader colleagues get together at APEC summits, do you ever talk about the implications of these bilateral and regional deals on the WTO and the multilateral trading system? Well, Susan, firstly, um, can I just uh, thank you for having me on the panel, along with, uh, it's great to be back with um, some good friends we have on this panel. Uh, thank you for the great work you did at USTR, and um, in particular, thank all of the ABAC members who have joined us, because one of the unique things, I think, about APEC is it joins both political leaders with business leaders um, from around the region, and that's the strength of APEC, is that uh, we are so cl uh, closely connected to the business community and we are making real change that can facilitate uh, business across the region and hopefully make uh, that a, a wealthier, more successful, uh, easier to do business place and we can got some great results to demonstrate that over the years. Uh, from New Zealand's point of view, you're right, I think we've been uh, leading the charge where we can in terms of free trade agreements, and that includes both bilateral deals, as an example, we're the only developed country in the world to have a free trade agreement with what is effectively all parts of uh, one China these days, so with mainland Beijing, uh, with Taiwan, uh, and obviously with Hong Kong, uh, right through to being a member of both RCEP and TPP uh, in most recent times. Uh, in terms of the broader question, I mean, do we talk to other leaders about the benefits of free trade and how we can um, sell that proposition, I guess, to our country men and women? I think the answer is absolutely we do. Uh, we see that as one of the big uh, gains that can come out of these annual meetings. And if you take TPP as a great example, uh, that was born out of effectively really the P4 and has now led to a situation where you've got 12 uh, countries uh, looking to come together uh, under one free trade agreement and hopefully with others joining over time. And that's been born out of the relationships we have uh, formed here at APEC. I mean, I think in terms of making the broader argument about uh, you know, why is free trade a good thing, I would say the best way of really explaining that is firstly take a look at the results that have been achieved in a country like New Zealand. Of course, you know, there is adjustment that takes place when you open up your borders and there is uh, an impact on, on various parts of your economy. But the overall benefits, both in terms of jobs, incomes and opportunity, uh, speak for themselves. So New Zealand has arguably the most comprehensive free trade agreement in the world with Australia and we signed that in 1983, it's been now uh, over 30 years, and that has seen you know, remarkable growth in opportunities. It's equally true if you take, for instance, China, where they have now, um, in fact, surpassed uh, the United States as New Zealand's second largest market, clips only by Australia, and I think very much assisted by what's happened with the free trade agreement, and it works both ways. I think secondly, um, if you think about a country like New Zealand where we are um, the largest dairy exporter in the world, but by no means the largest dairy producer in the world, we're about 3% of world production, uh, you know, we can use those free trade agreements to help um, transfer technology and grow domestic um, both success and opportunities. So in the very countries that we engage with in FTAs, we spend a lot of time working with their local um, agricultural sector, for instance, and making sure that, that there is technology transfer and there is great opportunities. Because for all of the fact that New Zealand is a large dairy exporter, in fact the world demand is growing for dairy at about the same rate as New Zealand, about 3% a year. So I think, uh, look, there will always be those who are opposed to free trade, even in a country like New Zealand, which has no subsidies and virtually no barriers uh, and has embraced free trade for a very long period of time. There are still opponents to free trade in New Zealand. But we would say, look at the facts um, of what's actually occurred in the last 30 years in New Zealand, contrast that with the rhetoric of those that are opposed, and I think the opportunities speak for themselves. And um, we just need to continue to make that case 
um, and speak loudly. And if I could make one final point, it would simply be this. It is really important that there are um, champions for free trade. And in this room, I suspect we have a great many. And if you speak out, um, in your local countries about the benefits of free trade. You provide a voice which um, hopefully sits alongside the political voice supporting free trade because there will always be those opponents. And if you remain silent but are, are fully supportive of, of uh, the extension of free trade, it very much becomes the politicians isolated on their own and presents, I think, an unbalanced picture to the populace who don't necessarily focus blow by blow on these issues. So your, your support, your vocal support, uh, can make a huge difference in changing public opinion. I think that's very important. Th thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, Prime Minister Key has, has raised a really important uh, point that is really at the, at the intersection of what goes on here at APEC, government, business getting together. And, and Minister Gita, you are perhaps the best person to follow on to this, uh, on this topic, your private sector experience and your government experience coming together. Uh, we all know uh, as a theoretical matter uh, that free trade is good, protectionism is bad. We know looking in the region that more open trade and trade agreements um, uh, enhance welfare. Uh, and yet we also know that when we negotiate these trade agreements, there's pushback from constituencies. Um, how do we better make that case uh, to our populations, to our citizens, particularly in democracies, uh, on behalf of more free trade, more uh, market liberalizing trade agreements? Thanks, Susan. You know, yesterday we were having dinner with some friends of mine uh, who are captains of industries and policymakers, and somebody shared in the room that there is a country in the U.S. I mean, in the U.S., a country such as the U.S., where some time ago they were doing a pulse, you know, pulse check on how the average person would view uh, free trade, and uh, actually the average people in the United States would believe in the existence of the UFO more than the benefits of free trade. Uh, this, this could be a joke, but this could be a reality that not only developed countries have to deal with, but I think developing countries like Indonesia have had to deal with for a very long time. I think it boils down to, you know, in the context of a country like Indonesia, which is the third largest democracy in the world, which is you know, about a quarter of a billion people living in this country. I think it boils down to how we can basically justify it to the people. Now, it sounds like a cliche. You know, we can talk about the empirical evidence that supports the theory that free trade creates jobs, it's good for the economy and all that, but the lay people out there don't get it. Now, in Indonesia, what I have found in the limited time that I've been with the government is that as long as you can argue for the supply side narrative, I think it helps in socializing the benefits of free trade. We've had some issues with you know, free trade agreements with some countries, but we have not had issues to the scale that we've had with respect to other countries. Now, it's really backed by a relatively strong investment thesis. Now, the countries that we've had free trade agreements with, and to the extent that they have been investing and in deploying capital that's visible to the eyes of the very people out there, factories are being built, manufacturing capacities are being built, jobs are being created, it makes it easier to argue for a free trade agreement, even a more sharp free trade agreement between the two countries. Now, this is something that I think largely hinges on the extent to which any particular country or economy has the supply side capability. Now, in Asia, you can pick some countries which have a fantastic supply side narrative. 
Taiwan, South Korea, China, and Japan. These are probably the earlier countries that would be willing to sign free trade agreements with anybody in the world because they've got a very strong supply side narrative. And I think the debate is whether or not the supply side is helped by a free trade argument or vice versa. Now, it's going to take time for countries like Indonesia when we still have to basically strengthen the supply side, be it in the agricultural sector or the manufacturing sector, and the financing wherewithal that's needed to basically support you know, excellence in the supply side of agriculture and manufacturing. But what makes it a little bit more complicated is the last few years of economic declination that we're seeing in many countries or economies. That makes, I think, trade discussions a little more complicated, which is why we're seeing the tendencies of regionalism and also bilateralism which is why we're not seeing the spirit of multilateral trading system thriving as well as we would have wanted it you know, ever since 2001. You've been a big witness to this, uh, which is why you know, the last couple of days when we were talking with all the other trade ministers from the APAC uh, you know, community, it's, it's good that we came to a landing on some package that would be good for the 21 economies. And this, I think, will send the right political signal to the rest of the world, the non-APEC countries, be it from Europe and Africa and Latin America, by way of the communication that's going to be done by the 21 members of APEC. Now, I think this will dovetail quite nicely for the purpose of the upcoming ministerial conference in December. Now, whatever extent we can get done, it's not going to be great. But if we can get a small package, like you said earlier, that could be ambitious from a multilateral trading system, I think this will send the right signal that not only the developed countries would like to see multilateralism work, but the developing and also the less developed countries. Thank you. I'm, I, I am going to come back to you on that, sure. on that question. I'm, I'm delighted that you introduced this topic. Um, you also introduced another topic, which is the the spaghetti bowl or noodle bowl, um, given where we are in the world. And I'm going to turn to Mike Ducker now uh, as, as uh, our first business representative. Uh, we've got lots of things going on here. We have TPP negotiations. We have RCEP negotiations. We have, uh, since, the, since the Uruguay round negotiations at the WTO, the last multilateral uh, mega round at, at the WTO, completed in 1993. Uh, we have had over 150 bilateral and regional free trade agreements go into effect. Uh, that clearly creates a rather interesting set of circumstances for small businesses, medium, large businesses. There's a lot going on here for a major service provider, multinational, like FedEx. Um, what does this mean? And what, uh, what is going on today? What are your highest priorities uh, on today's uh, agenda? On today's um, trade agenda, you're absolutely right. There is a heck of a lot going on. Um, but for us, I think if we had to, if we had to rank order them, uh, it would probably be uh, trade facilitation for a number of reasons, I think. Number one, you can make progress faster there uh, than you can in a, lot of, in a lot of other areas. You know, cross-border e-commerce is exploding and growing uh, like crazy, not nearly like e-commerce is, though, within the national borders. Um, and I think <clears throat> some studies, Peterson Institute would be one that I, that I would call out say that in a couple of years the e-commerce will be a one trillion dollar economy uh, could create uh, 20 million new jobs uh, and this really plays right into the whole small and medium business uh, discussion because making things easier for people to trade uh, across borders through harmonization of, uh, of tariffs through transparency of customs through uh, standardized de minimis values, 
uh, we see those kinds of things as being a great boon to the small and medium, medium enterprises uh, wherever they are. You know, big businesses like uh, um, many of our larger customers already have the global infrastructure put in place to, to handle those things. But it's the smaller uh, customers that really suffer uh, when they don't have a really predictable set of rules that they can follow. And, and I think that, that that would probably be at the top of the agenda. But we're also strong supporters of, uh, of TTP and the other free trade uh, initiatives that are underway today because uh, a company like FedEx, we see ourselves as a great enabler of, uh, of global trade as, as other companies involved in the transportation world uh, are as well. And having that predictable set of uh, rules by which you can manage today's increasingly global supply chains just improves your efficiency, your predictability, your risk management, a lot of those things that businesses have to take into account. So uh, we, we're a strong proponent uh, and we, we um, applaud the steps that have been taken. Um, it's been a uh, long, long, long uh, discussion and um, I think that that, that one, I mean, uh, <clears throat> Director General Azevedo has made this a uh, the trade facilitation piece that will happen right here in Bali in December, a huge part of his uh, um, agenda for the WTO. And uh, to Minister Gita's point, we need the WTO to be successful. Uh, we absolutely do. But uh, I, I don't think there's any way to put the genie back in the bottle with these uh, regional trade agreements that are popping up all over the place. So in short, I think probably the fastest action could be that trade facilitation round if we could if we could get that one completed. So we have trade fa trade facilitation under consideration in uh, the Doha mm -hmm. round. Uh, a lot of work uh, done on that uh, at APEC, pioneering work at APEC, uh, also a part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the newest uh, uh, member of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, going from 11 countries to 12 countries, obviously, is Japan. And so my question uh, for uh, Yona Kurosan, uh, as chairman of Keidanren, uh, and obviously also as, as chairman of a major Japanese industrial giant, uh, what are your highest priorities for uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, and also uh, for the RCEP negotiations? We, uh, Japanese business community, has been calling for the establishment of FTAP among uh, APEC countries uh, by the year of uh, 2020. And we regard TPP and RCEP as an important pathway to this goal. And uh, <clears throat> APEC members uh, should pursue this goal, simil uh, I mean regional FTAs, uh, simultaneously and work together to building a uh, high-level free trade system in the region. We have our highest priority in a RCEP and TPP uh, negotiations is to develop a more open and uh, uh, seamless business environment and also to uh, strengthen a uh, supply chain in the region so that goods, services, people, and capital can move across the national borders um, more smoothly and efficiently. And we have high expectation for a uh, TPP and, and RCEP that we hope will create a uh, new market demand and growth opportunities by enabling companies to enhance their efficiency of cross-border operations, ranging from uh, procurement, sales, logistics to investment, uh, transfer of uh, industrial uh, intellectual properties, uh, transfer of 
personnel and so on. And by scaling up these regional uh, FDAs to FTAP and also realizing a uh, <coughs> economic integration in this region, we are certain that we'll be able to make a, a growth of Asian Pacific area um, more sustainable, a strong, truly sustainable economy. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to do one more quick round of questions for our panel, and then I'm going to turn to the audience for uh, questions as well. So get your questions ready. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, I, I thought you made a, a really great pitch for the importance of making the case for free trade and the challenge as a political leader for making that case. One of the things that, that we did in the United States and we've done and you have done, countries negotiating uh, so-called 21st century trade agreements are doing, is adding ever increasing levels of, of uh, behind the border measures to trade agreements, uh, labor and environmental provisions, and other regulatory provisions. One of the questions that arises um, in uh, this area is measures to protect human health. And obviously one of the fundamentals of the GATT and the World Trade Organization uh, is the protection, mm -hmm. unquestioning legitimacy of protecting human health uh, and those regulations. And yet we find, uh, certainly as a former agricultural negotiator, uh, the increasing use, I found as USTR, of uh, sanitary and phytosanitary measures, uh, animal and, and, and plant uh, health as an excuse, quite frankly, for trade protectionism. So the question arises, here is New Zealand, a remarkably competitive agricultural negotiator, I mean agricultural exporter, fabulous wines, may say so. Um, you may. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Chief salesperson. <laughs> and, and you, and I suspect, and you had a false alarm with whey protein not too long ago, um, uh, you encountered these kinds of, of measures. How do you, how, how should we strike that balance between regulation and trade and free trade and uh, do you think we can strike that balance? Your thoughts, your thoughts on that, perhaps? Um, well, you're right. I mean, there are always, always risks, actually, that, um, that behind the border protectionism will be somehow used um, to frustrate the will of a free trade agreement. On the other side of the coin, I mean, it's hugely important that uh, the safety and health of consumers is both protected and actually understood. And I think when it comes to the consumption of food, and in the case of New Zealand where we are uh, very large suppliers in areas like infant baby formula, then the, the safety of those consumers and those young infants is absolutely critical. In fact, one of the things that I think occurs when free trade um, takes place is that the standards do rise, um, the transparency has to be absolute, and the confidence that consumers can have in that transparency has to be ultimate. And so uh, in recent times, you're right, actually, we, we have had through our major uh, dairy company um, the identification of what proved to be a false alarm. Uh, but nevertheless, the way that we reacted to that and ensuring that that information was communicated immediately to uh, international markets, that a product recall took place, uh, that the government has been at the forefront uh, with the company of identifying um, a number of inquiries which we will put into the public domain, ensuring that uh, we, we do live up to what we believe is the case, but world-class we'll, we'll testing and safety standards in New Zealand, and that all of that information will be shared and communicated is, I think, an, a, an important part of the process because, in the end, if consumers in your country are going to rely on a product manufactured in New Zealand, uh, then 
you know, you are in part bound by the rules and the standards that we set in New Zealand, and you're entitled to ensure that your consumers receive the same level of protection that you would expect of your own companies. And I think um, there, there's the, the second thing about that overall is that that I, I think that that technology, that testing, that level of transparency actually can be something that's built in and transferred, because while it's um, it, it can be both a competitive advantage for a country, actually overall it's one of the real benefits of free trade that consumers have better information, better knowledge, and the system works more effectively. So. You know, I'm very confident that we'll see that embedded in, in more FTAs and, and um, a greater sharing of that information, which is one of the things we do with free trades. And it's one of the points we have to make is that free trade is not about just getting access to one another's market that's, that's useful, but actually it's about building a relationship for the exchange of information and the, and the combined learning and enhancement of both countries. Transparency, science-based non-discrimination, all of that in balance? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you've got to get to a point where um, I think that consumers can pick up a product and say with a high degree of comfort that if it comes from another market, that um, certainly a market where there is um, an open trading relationship, that they could take the same level of confidence that they would a product, <coughs> excuse me, a product made in their home um, domestic market um, arguably, maybe even in some cases, even more. But that's that's critically important because, as we know, I mean, consumers uh, these days are, um, are rightfully so very fussy about making sure that those standards are met and letting the consumers choose. Absolutely. Yeah. Terrific. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Uh, Minister Gita, you started to um, get into this question, and I'm going to I'm going to ask you to to. Uh, uh, get a little further into the into the the very important issue of the WTO ministerial that will take place here in December. Uh, Indonesia, uh, for those of you who don't know, Indonesia in December will be hosting the biennial WTO ministers meeting. Uh, 159 members of the WTO, 159 ministers will descend on Bali, uh, and uh, Minister Gita will be hosting this um, undertaking. This particular ministerial, I would assert, may be the single most important ministerial of the WTO's history. Uh, not to put too much pressure on you. Uh, the uh, Doha round negotiations started in 2001. A business, most of this group is a business uh, community member. Business moves a little faster than this negotiation has moved. We are in 2013 and the negotiation's not done yet. Uh, I think the future of the WTO as a venue for multilateral negotiations, multilateral trade agreements is at stake. Now, obviously, Indonesia as host and Minister Gita as host, you aren't responsible for the rise and fall of the WTO, but as, as chair of the G33 group of countries. Um, there are things that, that, that countries look to you, your colleagues look to you to do, and it sounds like you've been working pretty hard to s see what you can do to make this successful. Love to hear your thoughts and insights and any predictions you might have <laughs> about the upcoming WTO ministerial. Well, I've, I've uh, thanks Susan, I've, I've made a point to tell all the 159 ministers of trade to make sure that they bring their swimsuits <laughs> when they come here in December in case nothing comes out successfully. Uh. <laughs> the good thing about doing anything in Bali is that we've got nice beaches and you know very good cultural events to look at. Uh, but. I think with what, what I've seen the last couple of days sitting down with our friends, uh, you know, from APEC and also in the presence of the new Director General of the WTO, uh, there is certainly a greater degree of optimism compared to what I might have seen two to three months ago uh, when I was last in Geneva. And, and Susan, you know, you know this better than I do. You've been in trade. Uh, much longer than I have, but you know, Indonesians are known to be quite optimistic people. 
Uh, we've, we've gone through batterings so many times for so long. Uh, if you would have been here in 1998, uh, everybody would have thought, you know, Indonesia was hopeless. But we came out of the, the hole nicely, you know, from a political and also economic standpoint. Uh, but with what I've seen, look, Michael had raised the, the point of trade facilitation. Uh, and the Prime Minister had aptly raised so many uh, good points, inclusive of transparency and all that. Coming back to trade facilitation, uh, you know, our friends in the least developed countries, we have some least developed countries in Southeast Asia. It, the bottom line is they don't mind moving the box faster at the port or at the airport. You know, if they're used to moving the box uh, in 20 days, they're happy to do that in two days. But their question is, okay, pay me, right? They need to be making the money. They need to be well compensated. Uh, that's really, I think, the, the fundamental stuff that, that needs to be sorted out. And I, I do believe that with the discussions that we have had the last mm -hmm. couple of months and especially the last couple of days, I think the messaging that's going to come out of APAC is going to be net positive. And I think if Roberto were to be able to lock up everybody in a room in Geneva to make sure that negotiations take place for the purpose of a small package on trade facilitation, you know, we, we may end up with some package that I think would be sending the world a positive signal in terms of the future of the Doha round. We should actually start calling it the Bali round because Doha has a bit of a negative connotation by way of the fact that it hasn't gotten anything done in the last 12 years. Plus, I'm from Indonesia. So, uh, the second, <laughs> the second bit, and this, you know, we've got lots of trade experts sitting on the front row here. Uh, the second is with respect to the agriculture package, and this has polarized you know, India and the U.S., and India has nicely packaged you know, their aspirations as the G33 package, which is coincidentally chaired by Indonesia. But I think the assurances that the Americans need to get in that you know, whatever that's going to be stockpiled will not be re-exported so that they not be distorted for whatever, uh, to the international market dynamics. Uh, I think there is a way to get closure on stuff like this. Uh, you know, India comes from a country of 1.2 billion people. They need to be able to give the assurance to the 1.2 billion people that they will be in a position any time of the year to be able to feed them with food. So they've got to have the capacity to stockpile some food. But as long as whatever is in that stockpile is not going to get re-exported, that would be disruptive and distortive to the international markets. Uh, I think with the last couple of days, you know, I sat down with Froman yesterday and the day before, uh, I think we may be able to, you know, get some closure on, on these two things. With that, December, as rainy as it may be, it may be pretty sunny, you know, and we may be able to come up with a small yet ambitious package that would signal to the world uh, in a positive way. We'll call it, call it the Bali breakthrough. Mm -hmm. Just call it the Bali package. <laughs> I'm all for that. That would be marvelous. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mike, you'd like a Bali breakthrough? We'd love a Bali breakthrough. Bali package. Keep the uh, keep the ball moving forward. Mm -hmm. Now it se it seems to me one of the groups that needs to be convinced that trade's a good thing, uh, that our political leaders here need support from are small and medium sized businesses. Uh, talk a little bit about how, in your experience, trade does benefit small and medium sized businesses. It seems to me that that express package delivery companies uh, get a particular view of that um, from where you sit at FedEx? Tell me. Yeah, 
I think they would uh, they would certainly be some of the big biggest beneficiaries, as I said a little bit earlier. Uh, a lot of the large global customers already have this infrastructure in place. Uh, in one study that was recently completed by uh, U.S. Commerce Department, you know, they, they talked about the small and medium enterprises, and only 1% of those uh, are really exporting. And those that are exporting are exporting to only one country. And if you take a recent study by uh, eBay, another customer, thank you if you're in the audience there, but uh, eBay says that 94% of their small and medium uh, customers are now beginning to export cross-border internationally, and they're going to five countries. And I think what's happening out there we need to pay attention to is that supply chains are becoming global. Small and medium enterprises want to sell to the world. And we've got a number of uh, examples all around the world where if you combine uh, the internet and you combine that with the ability to source and sell online with a physical delivery network anywhere in the world, there's a great propensity for people to sell and trade uh, across borders and they don't have to be large multinational corporations. They can start the business from their garage we have many, many customers who uh, have started from very small beginnings and grown into uh, global exporters using uh, the tools that are available to, to them with the internet, e-commerce, and physical delivery networks. So uh, I think, and to the, to the extent that we can uh, improve the conditions of that global supply chain to make it more efficient, more predictable, uh, I think that uh, businesses will benefit around the world. So those are some of the things that, that we're seeing. And really, small and medium enterprises are the, the, the bulk of most major economies. That's where the new job creation comes in the main. That's where uh, most of the business activity gets started. And I think that it, it would really be a boon to uh, entrepreneurship, new business startups, that sort of thing. Terrific. A lot of the creative part of <clears throat> creative, Schumpeter's creative destruction. Uh, Mr. Yonakura, Japan, you've got a lot of creative destruction that's gone on in, in, in Japan. Uh, things are looking up with uh, Abenomics. The third arrow of Abenomics is TPP. Nemowashi, the consensus building process in Japan is always taking a lot of time. The pace of the TPP negotiations seems to be a lot faster than the decision making processes that I recall during my days of negotiating trade agreements with Japan. How is that going to work? Because it seems to me there'll be trade-offs required among industry, agriculture, services. How do you see that playing out? I think uh, Japan has taken too much time to, to make a uh, decision on participation in, in TPP negotiations. Uh, uh, since uh, then Prime Minister can uh, announced his intention to uh, uh, join TPP uh, uh, three years ago in, in Yokohama APEC meeting. But then uh, your discussions really became hot. But now uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe took the leadership to, uh, to make a decision <clears throat> to participate in TPP negotiation. And uh, I think a, uh, since we joined a TPP negotiations in July, I think they are doing rather uh, good job. And uh, once you said that it's just like uh, jumping on the moving train, uh, but they show a uh, good reflexes uh, not without, not uh, being thrown out or, 
or without uh, slowing down the speed of the train. And uh, rather, we think uh, yeah, they are uh, very much contributing to the, uh, to the negotiation uh, process. And the reason for this is that the government established a, a special task force for TPP. They call it a headquarters for TPP negotiations with Minister uh, Amari uh, as its head. And this special group headquarters are responsible for negotiations and also take charge of uh, pu putting together a, a negotiation strategies and also developing a uh, domestic uh, policy measures uh, necessary to implement TPP. And I think <clears throat> this, with this special task force in place, a government's uh, decision-making uh, uh, process has become very fast and also better coordinated. And so we think, uh, although we are late comer, but we, we may be able to contribute a, uh, to the progress of TPP negotiation quite a lot. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to um, our audience and collect a couple of questions for this uh, remarkable panel. Uh, I have, yes, the young lady. Microphone. Yes, her. Thank you. And, and the headsets, yeah, if you need the headsets. Oh. Um, first of all, please let me I, um, explain my sincere appreciation to all speakers. Uh, my name is Megumi Yoshinaga. I came from Japan. I'm a student in Waseda University. Um, I have a question to Mr. Yonekula. Um, my first question is, how do you evaluate the economics? Everyone knows that economics um, refers to Japanese economy uh, policies, and then um, Abe aims to expand the economy policies, such as uh, the surge in public uh, infrastructure expenditures. Um, how do you evaluate, like, uh, what's and what's the insufficient things of it? And my second question is. What do you expect um, toward the Olympic in 2020, going to be held in Tokyo? What kind of policy are you, do you expect? Thank you. Arigatou uh, gozaimasu. If we can, may I, may I pick up a couple of questions and keep that one in mind and I'll come back. Uh, yes, sir. Um, yes, um, Professor Ken Morgan from the University of uh, Flinders in South Australia. Um, I'd like to offer my condolences to Prime Minister Key over the recent loss. Um, we in the uh, sailing community were uh, looking forward to a, a new trading system of the rules base for sailing would have changed with a New Zealand's win. Um, so, and it looks into where to next, and that is the issue. I've heard a lot about trading, trading behind the borders, highly quantitative issues when it comes down to the upcoming WTO and that. But I like to look at the issues that are the SMEs that are driving, and that is in services. Your country, New Zealand, with Peter Jackson, has been a major contributor to the entertainment. Um, we take a look at a lot of growth rates. If, for some of us that are here at Blake Island, in uh, the original the ABAC and APEC, Facebook wasn't there. Um, a lot of the e-commerce wasn't really around, but yet today we see uh, Michael Drucker's company doing an awful lot of business in the shipment of goods because of e-commerce. 
And with the U.S. government presently under its financial constraints, many states, many local governments in the U.S. and elsewhere are all looking at taxing the Internet. Can you uh, share with us your views on uh, how, where the role of services comes into um, uh, trade agreements and particularly the issues of are you in favor of taxation of the Internet? Um, look forward to hearing what you're saying. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Why don't I get one or two more questions? Uh, this this gentleman right here in the second row, and then I'll swing over there, and then we'll answer some questions and come back. Yes, thank sir. you, Ms. Susan. Uh, this is questions to Prime Minister John Kay. Uh, congratulations. Also, you take a position of Obama to take a lead as a TPPA discussion. Uh, the question is, why this APEC talking too much about the trade agreement? We have uh, AFTA, we have ASEAN FTA, we have, you have uh, NAFTA in America. But the problem is, the basic is, how you put the, this issue, balancing of the knowledge of this industry within the countries. This is the basic message. So far, like Indonesia import a lot of dairy products from New Zealand. 90% almost we import. You are not put any company into Indonesia to develop the dairy industry so far. That's number two. All the members of APEC not agree with the palm oil as a one of the eco energy and eco friendly of the business investment in the world. So this is not fair. So we put like this issue to you to discuss in that meeting. And I hope Pak Gita will support that. And the other issue is how you bring this Asia Pacific to be equal in the economy and trade. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. One more question. Um, the gentleman right in the middle of the pack over there. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a student from China Foreign Affairs University and I'm with the APAC Voices of Future group. My question is that it has been constantly and continu continuously argued by this panel that transparency of tariffs as well as harmonization of regulations are key for facilitating more trade. But the unique point about APAC is it's a very consensus-based organization. So do you believe the prospect of APAC would remain a consensus-based organization or do you believe in order to achieve the goal of a more transparent tariff system as well as harmonization of regulations, there should be an organization that could exercise authority over a country so it could turn to something more of a rule-based organization? What is your point? What is your view on the um, prospect of APAC in the future? And this question is directed to Mr. Prime Minister, New Zealand Prime Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have uh, four terrific questions, and uh, perhaps let's see. Why don't we? Why don't we start? Well, Mr. Prime Minister, you have a whole bunch of questions. You are the favored. You are the favored destination for questions. Do you want to start, or do you want to hold your fire and go last? Uh, why don't we kick off? Well, afresh. Let me just take a point on the internet and services. Um, without doubt. Uh, there's tremendous growth happening in that area, and of course they've got to be part of uh, free trade and, and the negotiations that we have. I mean, I think if you look at a small country like New Zealand, we have always suffered from the tyranny of distance. We're at the bottom of the earth, we're a long way away. And the, there have been two big factors actually that have been driving economic growth in New Zealand over the course of the last 10 to sort of 20 years. And that's really been the emergence of Asia as a uh, much wealthier, highly populated um, uh, set of countries that is interested in buying products from New Zealand. And the second thing's really been the internet and the fact that we can both 
make products and, and effectively market those products very, in a very cost-efficient form through the internet, and secondly, sell services um, through the internet. And so that's, that's really connected New Zealand on a cost-efficient basis. And I, and I see that when I lead um, trade missions out of New Zealand. We were recently in India, we've been here in Indonesia, uh, we've been to Korea, um, Japan, many other countries. And actually I'll have as many lawyers or architects or, or other service-based uh, people with me, software engineers, as I will have tr people from traditional businesses. So firstly, I think it's critically important. Secondly, do you have to tax that? Well, yes, I think um, we tax in New Zealand uh, products that are sourced from overseas up to a, you know, you know, above a certain threshold, so we have de minimis rules that apply. Uh, and I think that's something that countries will have to consider because in my view, this, this move towards globalisation is increasing in pace, it's not reducing in pace. So the fact that we're going to be looking to FedEx and, and, and Mike's company and, and others to ship things around the world and for us to source products on a global basis and have uh, less, less influence of borders is only going to intensify. So countries are going to have to consider that. And the real challenge actually for a country like New Zealand, because under our rules, under $400, something is, there is no uh, tax that's applied, whereas a domestic uh, retailer actually does pay tax, is how you can do that on a cost efficient way. And it's actually really challenging actually to work out how you uh, can apply a fair taxation but collect that tax without it being overly cumbersome. And I think that's something we have to do, have to work out with the logistic companies um, because we've been doing some work ourselves looking at whether people are actually abiding by the rules or maybe skirting around the rules. And certainly some earlier work tells us that, you know, that they're skirting around the rules. So I think that, that that's one thing. I mean, I think overall, um, in terms of, of, of kind of, you know, what set of rules should be in place and how should they apply in, in APEC is consensus. Yes, it's a consensus organisation, um, and it's an organisation where people are free to choose whether they want to be in a particular trade agreement uh, and ultimately what the rules of those trade agreements should be. And so in the case of, of uh, uh, TPP, we've got uh, 12 countries that have decided to join and be part of that. There are 21, obviously, um, economies or countries in APEC, so there's plenty of capacity for others to come in, and they should choose to come in when they want to, if they want to, and if they want to comply with those rules that are being set. Um, and ultimately, uh, that's true with RCEP and the other sort of agreements that, are, that also have their genesis here. So, um, yes, we, you know, it will remain consensus, but it'll, it'll be for people to choose whether there needs to be an authority that that governs those rules, um, as we have with um, with the WTO. Well, that's that's something for another day. I don't think that's necessarily something we need today. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Minister Gita. Maybe I could just add on two two points. Uh, the first is with regards to uh, the point that was raised on palm oil. Last year when we met up in Vladivostok, uh, Indonesia would have wanted to put into the basket of environmental goods uh, palm oil and some of the other products that are resonating well with the people in Indonesia. Uh, what we have come up with, and this has been agreed and inserted in the ministerial declaration uh, at APEC in Bali, is basically the, the understanding that we will basically support the promotion of products that basically would be supportive of sustainable development that would be through poverty alleviation and rural development. And this has been agreed upon by all the 21 ministers of trade. And this is actually, in our view, a more inclusive and holistic framework uh, which would allow mechanisms for anybody that has agricultural products such as Indonesia, uh, whether it's rattan, rubber, palm oil, or what have you, as long as they support sustainable development and as long as they support the alleviation of poverty and also rural development. Now this is also with a timeline of 2015 as we have had with the EGS that was basically crafted last year. I think this is a more 
inclusive approach where not only Indonesia can register, but other you know, countries of the APAC uh, community can do. Uh, the second, I just want to you know, basically make a comment on, on, on the point of uh, you know, this harmonization and trade liberalization. I, I, let's not take for granted the fact that you know, we've had economic growth in the last few decades collectively by way of the peace and security that we've had in the last few decades. And I think APEC has a lot of that within this whole brotherhood or sisterhood. Yes, you know, the approach that we take is a consensus building type of uh, an approach. Uh, it's non-committal, but there's been very, very few things that we've basically gestured to the world that we haven't been able to do in the last, you know, 19 or 20 years since we basically started off with APEC. And a lot of that, I think, has to do with the spirit that there is peace and stability amongst the 21 countries. And that peace and stability, I think, would have been attributable to basically the consensus building nature of this whole big community. And this, I think, should signal, uh, you know, well to the rest of the world. Well, so, well said. Yes, Mr. Prime Minister. Sorry, if I could just make um, what one very brief point to add on the, the point Gita was making about Pamel. One of the real strengths of an organisation like um, APEC is you actually can set rules around authentication of environmental standards. And that debate around palm oil is actually running around New Zealand because we both import palm oil and we import palm kernel, which is used as a feed supplement. And some of the NGOs and environmental groups in New Zealand have been running quite a campaign um, in opposition to both that feed and to the palm oil. And so the point here is that if we can inject both um, authentication of the fact that, that this is a crop that is, is harvested in a way which is done environmentally and isn't, it, isn't coming at the destruction of rainforests um, and, and therefore the, all the implications of that, we can put a bit of um, fact behind what's actually happening and get consumer support for the fact that these products can be used and that's a real strength because otherwise you will get a boycotting of these products through misinformation that's spread by groups who will have their own motivations of why they might want to do that, but could be misguided, actually, in terms of what's happening um, in terms of the industry, Indonesian industry. So there's real strength that can come from, from these kinds of agreements, I think. Thank you. That, very, very helpful. Thank you very much. Let me, I have to wrap up because we're going to run out of time here. I know the Prime Minister is, uh, uh, needs to take off shortly. Mr. Yanakura, let me invite you to answer the question about Abenomics briefly, and then Mike Ducker, perhaps you want to say something quickly about services, and then quickly, we're going to wrap up. Uh, <clears throat> Abenomics uh, really a, a consists of three arrows, of course. A, a one, a one is a bold monetary policy, and second, uh, flex, flexible fiscal policy. And then third arrow, which is most important, is a uh, growth strategy. And growth strategy is to stimulate private sector investment. One of the main pillars is, uh, is really a promotion of economic uh, cooperation uh, by means of uh, EPAs and FTAs. And uh, beyond that, uh, we are now uh, pushing government uh, and government agreed to do so is a uh, implement bold, drastic, a uh, regulatory and institutional reforms, while we are a, addressing a also tax. Uh, fiscal and social security system reforms, and which, uh, which really uh, aim at stimulating economic uh, growth, and at the same time, restoring the health of public finance. And uh, first arrow and second arrow uh, already. Uh, shot, and uh, we are waiting for the 
a, a growth strategy. Uh, if we imp those a uh, strategy is implemented without delays and efficiently, then we are certain that the Japan will really come back strong and uh, 10 years from now or so will we, we'll be a more uh, resilient uh, economy contributing to the uh, uh, sustainable growth of the world economy. This is what we believe strongly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Mike? Mr. Ducker. Uh, very quickly, uh, Susan, I, I was just going to say, I think one of the things you're seeing with this multitude of uh, uh, trade agreements and uh, different initiatives that are occurring is that the globe is really a little bit fatigued with the pace of change. And, 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 and business uh, and economies are growing much faster than the regulatory frameworks, and so they create uh, for themselves ways to move forward. And I think the original intent of the, of the TPP was to have a very high standard trade agreement that was not exclusionary if you wanted to hit the standards. And I think that was the beauty of it. And that's why you're seeing uh, so many countries uh, want to sign on board. And I think you get the multiplier effect that the more companies, I mean countries, sorry, companies too, that you, that you get involved in these agreements, uh, that it really spurs, uh, spurs economic growth. So I don't think this is, this is uh, unusual at all to see the proliferation of things like TISA and TTIP and RCEP and, and TPP. And I think it, as long as they're building toward a greater, uh, greater goal, um, and I think finally I would just say that the one of the things that uh, the minister said earlier is that the consultative nature of, uh, of um, <clears throat> APEC in terms of implementing these goals, a lot of times you're building a lot more momentum by setting the high standard and creating something that people want to be a part of as opposed to a hammer. Uh, in terms of, of implementation because it allows some flexibility, some customization. Thank, thank you very much. I, I think you will all agree that we were really privileged today to hear from this distinguished panel. Please join me in thanking our panel and thanking APEC for putting this together. Susan. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, bringing to a close our fifth session will now allow for the departure of the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Ladies and gentlemen, we have no break ahead of our final session, session six. So we're going to start to change the room out and get ready for that final session. And do remain seated and comfortable as we prepare for our next session. <laughs>